All right, so we will go through and go slide by slide here. Okay. All right. So we'll start with the Afghan flag, perhaps. Sure. Oh, this is perfect, Shannon. I can see okay. everything, and this will really let me kind of talk about each one. Okay. Um, this is the flag that most people would recognize as F Afghan's flag, the traditional tricolor flag. Um, however, this no longer flies above the presidential palace in Kabul. It was taken down in September 2021, one month after the United States uh, withdrew from Afghanistan. So the flag that flies over Kabul now is a white flag with black lettering. Um, it's the Taliban flag and uh, lettering is the Arabic script for the Shahada, the Islamic oath. Um, interestingly, uh, this flag is still recognized internationally and of course still recognized by resistance groups within Afghanistan. So I'll go to the next one. We need a little code word here, <laughs> Shannon. The next one is uh, President Kennedy. And he is signing the executive order that established the Peace Corps. Um, he, it was established by executive order, as I said, and six months later then Congress approved it. And I usually get asked in a lot of presentations if the Peace Corps still exists. Yes, it does. Um, since 1961, about 250,000 volunteers have served in about 140 countries. Uh, the first volunteer was uh, deployed to Afghanistan in 1962, and the last group left in 1978. It was right before the Russians invaded. Okay, so I'll go to the next one, the map. Um, it's probably going to be a little hard to see. If I get right close to my screen, I can. Um, to kind of give you an idea of exactly where Jo lived and where she worked. You know, we've talked about Afghanistan for 20 years, and I think a lot of people would still would be hard pressed to, to place on a world map exactly where it's located. So as you can see, it's kind of nestled between Pakistan, India, Russia, and Iran. So if you look at India, the word India, and you go straight left or straight west, you will see um, Lagmar Khan, uh, province, and then right above that, um, you'll see Baglan. Um, uh, thank you, Shannon, you're kind of helping us out here. Uh, if you get up to um, Kunduz, K-U-N-D-U-Z, right below that is the city of Baglan. And then if you come straight down from Baglan, you will come into Kabul right there. If I don't know if you can see Shannon's cursor, but um, I can. So <laughs> um, Kabul is about 100 miles south of Baglan. Um, and why do I mention this or why do I think this is important? Um, well, everything the volunteers needed was in Kabul. Baglan was pretty much a rural village at the time. It's a town now. Um, I also want to kind of go back and mention as we kind of place Afghanistan on the map between Pakistan, India, and Iran, all the stands to the north of Afghanistan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, those were all part of the old Soviet Union, the USSR. And when the Soviet Union um, collapsed in 1991, they all became independent countries. And among those was Ukraine. So we've placed where Joe's at in Kabul. And so we know her in Baglan, I'm so sorry. She lived and worked in Baglan, which was north of Kabul. And she lived and worked with two other volunteers, a woman named Nan, Nan I'm sorry, and Mary. So we mentioned that it was 100 miles between Baglan and Kabul. And we, I mentioned that that's important because um, of everything that was in, in Kabul. Um, they had to go to Kabul anytime they wanted to get mail because the, the mail was not delivered to Baglan. So they picked up letters from home. 
Um, they went to the Peace Corps office, saw the docs there to get medical care, to get their malaria medicine. It was the only place they had access to an international phone line so that they could call home. You might remember this is 1969, so there were no cell phones and no internet. So Kabul was really their lifeline, their link to home. It was a place where they got um, supplies as well. So how long did it take to drive those 100 miles? Well, for starters, the volunteers traveled by taxi and they had to cross the Hindu Kush mountains. Um, from Baglan, the road twisted and turned and climbed to 12,000 feet then before it descended into Kabul. And the trip was about a five hour trip at best. So I describe what it's like to get a taxi and go to Kabul um, in the opening paragraph of the book. Taxi, Jo set her bag in the dust among wilted blades of grass worn thin by countless footsteps. A spindly row of trees cast elongated early morning shadows across the taxi bazaar, but already passengers were queuing up. A driver waved her forward, Kabul? He raised his eyebrows and nodded reflexively, eager for one more fare and a full pay payload. Zud Zud Shadan, hurry, hurry, I have one seat left. Joe climbed into the back seat of a sedan, a dusty Russian built Volga. Three Afghans immediately crowded in after her and she slid all the way across to the far door. Three more Afghans fit themselves into the front the one next to the driver wedged tightly against the gearbox. At least there was no one in the trunk. No last minute traveler had pushed his way through the bazaar, shouting above the noise and confusion to get the driver's attention, wanting to haggle for a reduced fare. But Joe had seen it often. Passengers climbing into the shadowy recess, their grins reminiscent of a Cheshire cat as they grabbed hold of a little handle on the inside of the trunk lid and pulled it down. But not today. No one was interested in riding to Kabul in the trunk of a car. The trip was five hours at best, and temperatures would be freezing in the high mountain passes. Okay, I'll go to the next one, Shannon. Thank you. So this is a picture of the Hindu Kush taken from the plane as Joe flew into the country. It's when she saw the mountains for the first time. And at that moment, I think she fell in love with the mountains. She found them to be majestic, stark, and beautiful in the winter, faintly green in the spring. They were always present on the horizon. And for me as the writer, the mountains became part of Joe's story. And then I'll go to the next one. So now if they took a taxi to get across the mountains to Kabul, the taxis in the city of Kabul itself, or the bigger towns, were these. They were called Gaudis. They were wooden carts drawn by a horse or donkey. Uh, the seats faced backwards, as you can see. And I like this picture for a number of reasons. Number one, the driver is turning around as if he's very pleased to have his picture taken. Um, and then you can note what Joe is dressed like. She obviously, there's nothing on her head. She's got a short skirt. Um, she's dressed in Western clothes. And on one hand, uh, you can kind of see a little purse. And so she probably was on her way to the bazaar. The volunteers lived among the Afghans. They shopped at the bazaar just like the Afghans did. They did not shop for American goods and did not live separately from them. Um, even though, um, the fact they traveled in safety with their heads uncovered, it did bring up the issue of gender. And I address this also in chapter one. The peculiar gender distinction was something Joe had grasped almost as soon as she arrived in Afghanistan. She traveled alone, safely, with her head uncovered. Therefore, she did not fit into the traditional perception of female. She certainly was not male. Well, what was she then? but an entity somewhere in between. And so out of necessity, the Afghans devised a convenient niche that placed Western women into a category of their own, a third gender, with the rights and privileges of Afghan men. As such, Joe and the other female Peace Corps volunteers moved about freely in Afghan society. And Joe had mentioned this several times, that the, especially the Afghan men, 
they were just beside themselves. I mean, how are they going to identify who these women were and where were they gonna fit them into society? Okay, and I'll go to the next one. This is a camel owner in Lashkar Gah. Um, of course, all the volunteers at one time or another rode a camel, even Mary. She was the oldest volunteer in Joe's group and she was age 60 when she joined the Peace Corps. Okay, and then I will go to the next one. This is Mr. Arsala. Uh, Mr. Arsala was their landlord. Joe, Nan and Mary lived in a compound. He owned it and he lived next door to them with his two wives and his children. So the one wife is to his immediate right. He's holding a baby and next to her, next to the baby then is one of the wives. Then there's Joe on his other side with his second wife. And um, I'm always taken by the little kids looking at Joe. In 1969, the American Peace Corps volunteers were probably the first Americans most Afghans had ever seen. They were absolutely fascinated. And so, especially the two little girls in front, they're just looking at Joe in awe, almost. As far as Mr. Arsala, of course, he was their landlord. So yes, he was there when they needed him, there to fix the well pump if it broke, there to shovel snow off the roof in the winter. But I think a lot of times for Joe, it was a love-hate relationship. She found him to be chauvinistic and patronizing at times. Okay, and the next one. Now this is Joe and one of her students, Sedica. Uh, they had about a dozen students, ages 14 to 22. Eight of them ended up going on to midwifery school in Kabul. Seneca was a quiet student. Um, she had kind of a poor self-image, according to Joe. She was practical, she was competent. She had a lot of common sense, but she could not read or write very well. Well, really none of them could, but Seneca more so. Um, so there's a hundred stories about all these volunteers and their students. Um, of course, there's one about Seneca in the book involving cheating on a test, but that's for the book. <laughs> Uh, the next one, this is the Friday Blue Mosque in mosar -e sharif It was built in A.D. 1136. And you know, I sometimes have a hard time wrapping my mind around the fact that some of these buildings and mosques are nearly a thousand years old. I think of all the ancient and beautiful mosques, the art, the artifacts, and the music that has been lost in Afghanistan over the last half century. <clears throat> Afghanistan has endured 50 years of continuous war, again, beginning with the Soviet invasion on Christmas Day, 1979. <clears throat> and I'll go to the next one. This is the same mosque. There were a couple of kids there playing and Joe took their picture. Um, obviously it's a little boy and his little sister. Their shoes are off because you took the sh your shoes off in order to enter the mosque. Um, and she made the comment that um, tourists would come around. And if most of us, I'm sure, will not remember, but at one time, cameras had that little square flash cube that went on the top. And when you were done with it, you just threw it away. Well, the kids would take those and play with them. That was the closest thing they had to toys. Okay, I'll go to the next one. Okay, so did I mention that the volunteers had to learn Farsi? that their students spoke no English. So here's the deal. All the Romance languages, English, Italian, French, Spanish, they're all written with the same Roman alphabet. So the letter B is a B, whether it's in the English word book or the Spanish word libro. Farsi, on the other hand, uses the Arabic alphabet and the sentences are written from right to left. So it would be nearly impossible to ask the volunteers to learn the Arabic alphabet and then learn the Farsi language. So they learned Farsi alphabetically, or I'm sorry, phonetically by transliteration. So what the what is transliteration? Transliteration changes the letters from one alphabet, in this case, the Roman alphabet, into the corresponding similar sounding letters of another alphabet in this case, the Arabic alphabet. So if an Afghan read the first line of this slide, 
he would be reading it in Farsi and he would read and he would pronounce it as assalamu alaikum which is the second line assalamu alaikum which is the phonetic translation of the Farsi and that's what the volunteers learned they learned Farsi phonetically and then of course the English translation is peace be upon you so now if this does not sound like fun it was not and actually training has its own chapter in the book and so I'll go to the next one this is Anorgul now Anorgul was the youngest of three girls in a family and they lived in the same street as Joe Nan and Mary they all three went to the nursing school so Anorgul was 14 and if Sedeka was very serious then Anorgul was the class clown and, and I'm not sure even that's the best description. She was 14, as we said, but she was a typical teenager with the know-it-all attitude. And you can kind of see it there. And she's posing here with her little brother. I write about the first time the volunteers met Anor Ghoul, and it was when they were doing the intake interviews for the school. My name is Pomegranate Flower, Anor Ghoul informed them. I am 14 years old and I graduated from eighth grade. She folded her arms, waiting for the next question. Do you have your eighth grade diploma? Anargul shook her head, nay, nay. A birth certificate? Anargul looked at Joe as if she had gone crazy. Why do I need a piece of paper to prove that I was born? Of course I was born. She held out her arms. I'm right here, see? She turned and smirked to a couple of her friends and the girls burst into laughter. Joe caught only a couple of the Farsi words, but it was enough to get the general idea. Don't the Americans know anything? So that's what they were dealing with as far as a classroom of teenagers. Okay, I'll go to the next one. This is an infant girl. Um, it was above their pay grade, but the volunteers eventually delivered babies and gave anesthesia. Now this was huge. They were not licensed to do either one. It was a hard decision and it weighed heavily on all of the women. I write about it in chapter 19, St. Elsewhere. Everything Joe had ever learned about the practice of safe medical care was irrelevant, it seemed. Syringes were boiled in a tin container over a kerosene stove and reused. Some days there was running water and many days there was none. Patients had lice and fleas. Doctors were trained or not. Oxygen was so scarce it was rationed for five minutes every hour. Flammable ether was dispensed in the presence of open flames, for God's sake. And intense intestinal surgery occasionally revealed the presence of roundworms. When Joe considered their circumstances, she thought perhaps Mary was right. They simply had to do what they could, the hell with protocol. The volunteers could adapt, or they could stand by and become judgmental, rendering them ineffective and useless. Neither was a satisfying solution, and over time, each woman worked within her personal capabilities, within the boundaries of what she was emotionally capable of accepting. As for the rest, well, there was always denial. So I'll go to the next one. Now this is Kamala. <clears throat> Kamala is pouring tea. She is, uh, Kamala's family was probably the family the volunteers were closest to. They spent a lot of time with Kamala and her family. But this particular photograph, I like for a lot of reasons. You might look really closely and I'll talk slowly so you can have a few minutes to see if you notice anything sort of unusual about her hijab. If you look closely, you can see that there are hair, hair curlers under her head covering. Uh, I write about Kamala in chapter 16 again, curriculum development, um, as Joe was giving an oral math test. And I relate this story because it kind of portrays Kamala for what she was, a natural leader, well-liked by her classmates. So here's Joe's question. If a woman goes to a bazaar with 50 Afghanis, and buys two watermelons for 10 Afghanis each, how much change will she get from the shopkeeper? The question set off a flurry of discussion. 
led by a student named Kamala. The girls talked over the price of watermelons in general. Well, they wondered how big the melons were. They argued over which shopkeeper had the best ones and debated whether or not it was a fair price. Once they were all in agreement, they worked out the calculation, compared answers, and made sure everyone wrote down the same amount. Joe was stunned. Sure, the volunteers had been forewarned about the communal society of Afghanistan. They had been told many times that while Americans prefer to work individually, Afghans are first and foremost part of a community that works together. But until this moment, Joe had understood it only on an intellectual level. To see the concept play out in front of her exceeded anything she had been taught in a classroom. Every activity, including taking a test, was done in cooperation. It wasn't cheating, it was a way of life. So I'll go to the next one. This is an Afghan physician. Um, there were no medical schools in Afghanistan in the 60s and 70s. And so if a young man wanted, had the means and wanted to become a doctor, um, many of them trained in France. So not only did they need to learn a medical profession, they also needed to learn French before they could even start. And a lot of the rural areas were without docs at all. Anyone with any medical experience or knowledge practiced medicine. And I'll go to the next one. Now this is Mary. This is the 60 year old who rode the camel and Mary was a good sport. I, you've got to give her that. Um, she was pretty um, stern. Um, she knew what she wanted to do. And here she's uh, talking with a man named Wahab. Now Wahab was the head nurse at ba Badlan Hospital. And I'm gonna describe him from again from chapter 19. Tall and almost painfully thin, Wahab was attentive to his patients and sensitive to their needs. Working with an empathy, born perhaps from the struggle he had with his own demons, it was common knowledge. Wahab occasionally took morphine from the hospital pharmacy. To everyone's surprise, Mary developed a close relationship with Wahab, teaching and mentoring the young man. The two were often seen in deep conversation. Wahab's head, inclined toward Mary and the older woman's starched white cap moving up and down as she spoke. Whether they discussed medicine or his personal affairs, Joe never knew. Now go to the next one. Now this is Joe and a volunteer named Harry. I tracked down most of the volunteers um, in Joe's group, but Harry was hard to find. He had since passed away, but I did locate one of his brothers in Georgia. Apparently, um, Harry was a very quiet man, and he had said very little to his family, his children, or anyone about his Peace Corps experience. So his family was amazed to hear about it, and they were thrilled to get the book. So I'll go to the next one. Okay, this is Kamala, again, another picture of her. Um, now, you can't tell from the photo, she's taking a pulse, but obviously she's taking a pulse of a man. Women were rarely in a hospital, even for childbirth. But the fact that it was a man and that was not her husband, not her brother, um, not her father, um, this was a hard concept for the volunteers to get past the girl's fathers, um, that they would be touching men that they did not know, and to explain to them that this was part of becoming a professional nurse. But now as far as the girls were concerned, well, no sacrifice was too great. So I'll go to the next one. Now I've mentioned Kamala and I've mentioned her family many times. This is Kamala's brother. Uh, here he is there at a family gathering, obviously. Um, he's with his uncle and some of his nephews and obviously they're playing for some family gathering. Um, there was no denying the fact that um, he had a, an attraction for Nan and Nan had a special attract, was attracted to him. Um, when he started wearing a white shirt and tie, every time the volunteers came to visit, it was pretty obvious that the attraction was mutual. So I described their relationship in chapter 26, Joe's Girls. Nan felt completely at home, surrounded by a close-knit and trustworthy family. 
The dynamic was much like her own family, fun and informal. She watched Kamala's brother play the Daria, a faint sheen of perspiration on his face as he forgot everything around him except the music. The melody of the stringed instrument coupled with the seductive rhythm of the Daria pulled Nan into an even more flirtatious mood. And it was a feeling she did not take for granted. She was an American, she was safe, but it was a dangerous world for Afghan women who could not dream of showing their feelings so openly. She wondered how it would feel to have her freedom taken away. If she wanted to marry Kamala's brother, for example, but was sold to someone else instead. And what if she did marry him? Would he be a loving husband? Would he take another wife? It was all conjecture. And yet Nan suddenly felt dizzy as if she stood on the edge of a precipice, swaying, fighting desperately to keep her balance. In her mind's eye, she dropped to her knees and crawled backward from the ledge, her body trembling, her breath coming in short gasps. The women of Afghanistan had no choice. They were forced to jump and there was no safety net. So I'll go to the next one. Ah, here we go. You finally get to see a close up of Joe and Nan. Um, they were an unlikely pair, I will say that. Um, the person on the right would be Joe, serious, introspective, took everything to heart, also obstinate, hard-headed, and stubborn. And on the other hand is Nan. She was a true extrovert. Nan could find something funny in the absolute worst situation. She was always ready for a party, a drink, a good time. And yes, the spoiler alert, this was a group of young adults after all, duh, yes, there were parties and booze. Um, these two became lifelong friends and their friendship extends to the very day. And as I've mentioned earlier, to this duo, you could add the personality of Mary, older, wiser, and practical. And they were the three women who lived together in Baglan. Okay, I'll go to the next one. Surprisingly, this is the only photograph that remains or has survived of the house they lived in. It's a compound, it's made out of adobe. Um, the attraction for this particular property was the fact that it had electricity. If they had electricity, they had water because then they could have a well pump to pump the water. It was pumped to uh, wooden barrels at the top of the house and then it came down through a little pipe on a little room off the corner of the kitchen and uh, it came down by gravity and they just opened a spigot to get water. The house was heated in the winter by a little stove called a bukkeri. So that's their house. Um, there's a little path that comes to the door and then the, the yard or whatever was just really weeds. So I will go to the next, whoops, sorry. I'll go back one if I can, Shannon. Oh no, that is the next one. Sorry, sorry. We have actually the fourth character in the book. And this is Alex. Um, jo was an animal lover and she still is. She adopted Alex as a puppy. Um, he was running wild. All the dogs in Afghanistan at that time, I don't know what it's like now. I would imagine it's not much different, but dogs run wild. There are no pets um, as far as um, dogs or cats. The Afghans were absolutely flabbergasted that the Americans would give good food to a dog and feed a dog. Um, but obviously Joe did, and he became part of the family along with Nan, Joe and Mary, and of course, a character in the book. Okay, then we have, this is Nan on the far left and she's with some of her students. You may recognize Seneca, she's kneeling in the front. Um, I don't see Kamala in that particular one, but, um, but yeah, it was, the girls were naive and it was hard to teach them the, um, the protocol of a classroom. That was probably the hardest thing. Plus the fact that they were starting a nursing, nursing curriculum absolutely from scratch. So I will go to the next one. And it is just um, another picture of Mr. Arsala's two wives. Um, Joe mentioned that um, when they first moved in, that the wives would stack wood or it boxes or whatever they could to stand on so they could peek over the compound wall and just watch 
the American volunteers. And Joe said, you would just have the sense that something was watching you and you'd glance up and you'd see two, two pairs of eyes just suddenly disappear. So, um, but they did make, make them feel welcome. All right, and the next one is um, kids in the neighborhood and they're playing um, in a Jewy. A uh, Jewy is that little canal of water. If you've, over the last couple of years of, as Afghanistan has been in the news, if you've noticed in the background, there's always like a little canal or little rivulet of water. The Jewies are everywhere in Afghanistan. And I described them in one of the footnotes actually. Um, it's at the end of chapter four, first impressions. Jewies, a system of water-filled ditches, <clears throat> excuse me, that flank the streets and roads of Afghanistan. The surface of the water shimmers in the sun, inundated every spring with melting snow from the Hindu Kush and narrowing to little rivulets in the countryside with the pleasant sound of gurgling, rushing water. Jewies are nevertheless convenient receptacles for waste and garbage, comparable to open sewers. Animals drink from the Jewies. Farmers use them as irrigation. Kids pee, little kids pee into them, and Afghans water flowers and gardens with Jewy water. On occasion, Peace Corps workers fell into them. I'm sure that had nothing to do with the parties. Okay, I'll go to the next one. <clears throat> this is Dr. Ali. He was head of Baglan Hospital. Um, he butted heads with Mary more than once. Um, I think he envisioned the Peace Corps volunteers as working for him as nurses and um, to get him to agree that they were there to teach, not to just work. And um, eventually he came around to their side. But I would just, I'll say this much about him and Mary. Um, he met his match when he met Mary. So I'll go to the next one. <clears throat> Another picture of Kamala and she's there with the ambulance driver. And then the next one, uh, this is a woman making naan. Um, I was really surprised a couple of years ago, the first time I saw naan in the grocery store. I had never heard of it other than <clears throat> through Joe's notes and talking to her. It's unleavened bread. And the traditional Afghan way of making it is this. First of all, excuse me, you dig a hole in the ground a foot or so deep. You pat the sides of it till it's smooth and hard. Then you light a fire at the bottom of the hole. You let the fire down to hot ashes. You put the bread, the unleavened dough along the sides of the hole. You press it against the sides. And then when it's toasted and done, you peel it off, brush off the dirt and eat it. So that's naan. Uh, that was a staple. And in the morning, uh, they had boys that would go around and shout up and down the streets, non-garm, non-garm, meaning hot nan, hot nan. And then people would go out and buy non hot in the mornings. Okay, the next one is a picture of Jo and her students. Um, I believe that's Kamala then to Jo's immediately left and then um, Seneca would be next to that. Unbelievable as it sounds, about three or four months into the program, they lost their first student to tuberculosis. And who loses, you know, um, who dies of tuberculosis these days? But in, in then it was a big deal. And obviously, as time went on, they did one to an early marriage. Okay, I'll go to the next one. And this is Joe, um, the governor of Baglan province. Um, somehow managed to get uh, white fabric and white material. And so Joe was able to make all the girls um, some uniforms. And I think that kind of brings me to the end, to the end of the book. Um, I had talked earlier about strands. I feel like there's three main things when I give presentations, Joe's personal story, and that's always number one. That's what started this whole thing. Uh, the second one is the background, the history, the end notes. And, um, and then the third thing is the writing process itself. And so my questions afterwards can go on any one of these. I'm gonna make one comment about writing um, if we don't get to it later. And that is for any aspiring writers, join a writer's group. You cannot do this on your own. When I started this story, 
it was Joe's story. Absolutely. I had all her personal effects. I had interviewed her. I interviewed men. It was a huge process. But then I started to go down the rabbit holes of research. You, you couldn't put this with, you couldn't write this story without putting the background into it, the historical background. It just was so important to this story. And in my writing group, now this, you'll be shocked at this, I know I was the oldest one in the writing group, but it was in Chicago. And I will say, kids, I mean, I had children, the ages of some of the participants in this group, they were fabulous. They did not treat me any differently than, than each other. But one of them was just very frank. And he said, Sue, I love Joe's story. I get so involved with her and I care what happens to her. And then I hit a chunk of history. I hit a chunk of end notes about culture or Afghan life. He said, you've got to separate it out. Well, from the beginning, I had resisted end notes. I mean, who wants to write a book with a bunch of footnotes? I mean, really? So I took his advice and it was the best thing I ever did. You can read this book without reading a single end note. You can read just the end notes and not the book. It's, it's two parallel <laughs> things that just complement each other. So, so we have Joe's story, we have the background, the end notes, and then we have the writing process itself. I will say just one or two things before we finish up. Um, when Joe lived in Afghanistan, it was a constitutional monarchy. They had a king. His name was King Mohammed Zaire. The country had been at peace for 30 years. It was a member of the United Nations. Girls were going to school, women going to university. And then on Christmas Eve, 1979, the Soviet Union invaded. I do not think I can overstate the significance of that invasion. The consequences are felt to this day. I think Mark Twain has been quoted as saying, history does not repeat itself, but it often rhymes. The first Russian soldier that marched across the border on that day marked the beginning of the end for a peaceful, progressive Afghanistan. And unknown to anyone at the time, it also marked the beginning of the end for the Soviet Union. After 10 years of fighting, a million Afghans dead and the country in ruin, the mighty Soviet army withdrew. They had been defeated by a ragtag band of guerrilla fighters called the Mujahideen. It was a humiliation on the world stage. And two years later, on Christmas 1991, the Soviet Union collapsed. Almost immediately, 15 countries from Armenia to Uzbekistan declared their independence from Russia. And as I mentioned earlier, one of those countries is Ukraine. So here's where the rhyming part of the history shows itself. It is becoming more clear by the day that Vladimir Putin intends to restore Russia's original boundaries. So the book we talked about today, however, is first and foremost about Joe. It's a coming of age story, how she grows and changes over a period of two years. But there were a lot of nuances and a lot of historical background. Um, I will say the book is available on Amazon. It's available on Barnes and Noble, paperback, Kindle Nook. There are, I think, a couple of copies that I've sent to the uh, River Forest Library. So you can get them from the library here. But even as good as these programs are, and I love Zoom, I wish I could be there in person because I love meeting all these great people and I can't do that. I'm going to get around it um, by saying this. If anyone is a member of a book club and would like to discuss the book, email me and I'll send you a couple of complimentary copies. If you're into writing reviews and think you'd like to throw one up on Amazon, email me. I'll send you a copy. So why am I doing this? Why am I giving away free books? Because this is an amazing story. It is part of America's story. It captures what is best about America, her generosity, her goodwill, her desire to make the world a better place. At one time, at one time, these qualities defined who we are. I don't want this story to be forgotten. So to get a book, I would say email me directly. There's an email site on the website, but sometimes they get lost in spam. So my email is 
pretty easy. Sue Fox, lowercase, one word, S-U-E-F-O-X dot writer, W-R-I-T-E-R at gmail.com. So I would love to hear from you. So I will say thanks to the River Forest Library. Thanks to Shannon. And thanks to all you who've joined me this afternoon. And boy, we've got maybe 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes. I'll take questions if there are any. All right, well, thank you, Sue, for that wonderful presentation. And we also like to thank the River Forest Township for sponsoring this program as well. So another wonderful program. So it does look like there is a question in the chat about how did you come across Joe's Diaries? Okay, <laughs> you know how you are friends with someone for years and years and years, and you know this thing about this person, but you forget about it. And this goes back to um, several years ago, something came up about Afghanistan and Twin Towers and all this that was happening. And Joe mentioned Afghanistan and I'm like, oh my God, Joe, I totally forgot you were in Afghanistan in the Peace Corps. We were both nurses and we worked together. So we knew each other pretty well. And we've known each other for a long time. And Joe says, yes, I was. She goes, and I have all this stuff. And she goes, I really need to write about what I've done. I go, Joe, you absolutely do. She goes, I know. She goes, I get everything down and I don't know where to start. And I put everything away. And I'm thinking at the time, well, this would be something I could do for my friend. I mean, how long would this take? I, well, Joe, I'll write something up for you. And I thought, well, this will take me, you know, a couple of weeks. I'll write up a little thing for her. Well, I got into it. And six years later, <laughs> took me six years to write this book. I, I realized like two days into this, this was not going to be a little two or three paragraph thing. So um, I'm going to say this much about Joe. It was a wonderful working relationship. Joe did not care if it was a Tuesday or a Thursday. She didn't care if the table was brown or blue. She didn't care the details that did not matter. She cared about the truth of the story. So she let me tell it. The only thing that I changed was to get a narrative arc. There was an, a time when she did become ill and it was shortly after she arrived in country. I moved that to later in order to give the story an arc and she was fine with that. So. She was so fun to work with. And I also will say, I interviewed her, her diary, her writing was hard to read, number one. And number two, it was from so long ago, it was hard to remember. I would interview her and then I called Nan Liz on the East Coast and I talked to her once a week for like three years. Um, and I would ask her about the same incident or the same story. And I'm like, are you sure, Nan? Are you sure you were both in the same place at the same time? Because of course, Nan being the optimist, everything was fine. Joe being the <laughs> being a little more serious. So that was fun. But that is how I came to get all her information. And she was so generous. She shared everything she had with me. That's wonderful. Yes. And Linda mm -hmm. says, thank you so much. I agree that it's an important story that should be known. So that's that's very nice. So has she ever been back to Afghanistan that you know of? I know no, it's a she, different place now. Oh, absolutely. Nan had, did go back one time and she met the girls and several of them had gone through midwifery school. One div actually divorced her husband. Another one was ill. Um, so it was interesting to see. In one of the footnotes, I bring up the fact that near Baglan, there was an explosion. This is probably oh, 15 years ago. Um, the chances of those girls surviving till now are probably pretty slim. How long again was she there? Two years. Oh, wow. Two years without going home. So that's a long time. The girls, the three women did, were granted time away and they went to India, which was a whole other adventure on its own. Um, but the, she didn't go home in that whole time, which is a long time, especially when you consider they didn't have email or like we have Zoom, you know, that's a long time. That book opens with her making a trip to Kabul because she had gotten a letter that her father was ill and she was beside herself and wanted to get to Kabul to make a phone call to just be reassured that he was okay. Wow. I know, wow. <laughs> and, the, and all the responsibility they put on them too, that's... You know, and amazing I think, experience, but scary. Right. 
it was very serious. And I think the Peace Corps has changed somewhat. I mean, this was in the early years of the Peace Corps. They had to find their own housing, which was a chapter in itself. They had to figure their way around. It was a lot. They, yeah, yeah, a lot to put on them. And um, just establishing the school, getting it um, certified, it, it, was, it was a lot. Yeah, she was ready to come home at the end of the time. But it changed her and, you know, um, it, I think anybody who's been in the Peace Corps says it's the most rewarding experience you could ever have. Thank you, that was fascinating. <laughs> Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions for Sue? We can put them in the chat or you can just unmute yourself and ask. Well, yeah, it is a pleasure. It's, it is just an absolute pleasure to meet everybody and do this. And thank you for listening. Um, I will, <laughs> I will say Joe was with me every step of the way and every draft. And if anybody in this group writes, you know that the, you've got to have your first shitty draft. I think that's just, <laughs> I mean, you know, look at any book about writing. And so my first shitty draft, which I knew it's what it was, and Joe would go, oh, Sue, I love it. Don't change a thing. <laughs> then I'd come out with the next, oh, Sue, I love it. Don't change a thing. So she was yes. very, you know, very enthusiastic about it. Because, I mean, this story is important to her as well. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a time in our history that you just, you don't want to see that lost. It's, and it's what's, what has happened. I mean, who knows? But um, you don't know how much good they did in the long run. But certainly the intention was good there to just the the three threefold um purpose of the peace corps was to understand other countries better to have people from other countries understand americans better they got to meet americans and then the third one was to do you know the farmers the teachers the nurses to do something for the community so so there it is so, Great. Thank you, everybody. Well, thank you so much thank for you. joining us. Yes. Yeah. And like Sue said, you can check out the book at the library. We we're happy to get it for you. So so great. So, and, you know, keep an eye on our website. We do have most of our programming is virtual for right now. So I hope everyone stays healthy. Um, yeah. But, you know, we're here if you need anything. So okay. have enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Thanks again, Sue. It was wonderful. Right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye.